Hey everybody, thanks for tuning back in. I'm Chip with Main Street Mower and today we have a fun subject to talk about. The five things to check when you're buying a used mower. Five things that could save you a lot of money in the future and help you bring that asking price way down with some good knowledge and insight on what's actually wrong with this machine. So at Main Street Mower we offer trade-ins. Before we buy anything off anyone, we check at least these five things. These are five things that you should be checking too if you're gonna be buying a used mower, say off Facebook Marketplace or from a friend to make sure you're not buying a dud, but instead buying a stud. Woohoo, stud! Injuries and mower problems are very similar, right? From the outside, you might not really know that I've had new tendons and bone put in this knee and that I can't run or barely even walk. And in the same way, you might not be able to tell that this mower has a bad hydraulic and it could cost you thousands of dollars to repair it. So stay tuned, buckle up, check it out. We're gonna save you some money. So many of you have lots of reasons to buy a used mower, especially with new mowers costing as much as they do these days. So just pretend with me for a second that you are a landscaper and you're trying to buy a new mower to add to your fleet. And you wanna buy a good used mower at a good price. You're on Facebook Marketplace cruising, trying to figure out, is this thing any good or not? So pretend we found one we like. Maybe it's this 60 inch rear discharge behind me, right? We found one we like and we wanna go check it out and make sure we got everything we need to make it a good mower. So here are the five things I'm gonna do before I buy that mower. The first thing I'm gonna do is the look around. The look around is as easy as it sounds. You're gonna literally walk around the mower. You're gonna walk around it and you're looking for anything that shouldn't be there, anything that stands out at all. And this is with the mower cold and not running. You're looking for burn marks. You're looking for rust on top of the deck. You're looking for bald tires. You're looking for holes in the seat. You're looking for anything that's kind of out of place, strange about the machine, or maybe uncomfortable, whatever. For instance, the rear tires. If the rear tires are flat or, ha or bald or have multiple holes, if you ever see two plugs in a tire, that tire is probably going to have to be replaced. A bald tire will be, have to be replaced. And those tires aren't cheap anymore. It used to cost you around $100 installed, and now you're closer to $150 installed, and that's per rear tire. If it needs a front tire, if it's a solid front tire and the bearings are bad, it could be as high as $250. So it's something to really pay attention to because if it has all the tires bad, you just spent $800 on tires. How did we go bro? So if someone's asking six grand for a mower, you could talk about the tires and maybe bring it down a notch, right? The other thing you want to look for is just corrosion. If they park this next to a pool pump or where they keep their chlorine or their salt for their softener, it could just destroy the metal on this machine. Your carburetor linkages and your hydraulic mounts and all this kind of stuff can just disintegrate. So rust really matters too. Holes in the deck, Oi, don't even get me started on holes in the deck. Holes on deck, she As dirt flies up on top of your deck, it's gonna add added wear to your belts, added wear to your spindles, added wear to your idler arms, added wear to your spindle bearings, on and on and on and on. Your bushings that hold your deck, that deck has to be sealed, it cannot be compromised, right? So little things like that are things you're gonna notice on the look around. You're gonna walk around the unit, you're just gonna keep them in mind, point them out, man, I see that, I see that, I see that. And now moving on, right? You're gonna go on to the next part. It's important that you check out the seat. I know something as simple as a seat might not seem very important to you, but a seat really matters. It's where you make contact with the unit. The seat and the handles are something you want to be very comfortable with while you're using the unit. If the seat has some small holes in it, it's still gonna function as a seat as long as you don't mind your butt getting wet. I do mind. But if it has large chunks of foam, if you're gonna be riding crooked or sideways, or leaning and twisting your back, it's really gonna cause problems over time and it's gonna actually hurt your employer attention. Maybe you're the end user and you don't mind a wet butt, but the seat is an important piece of the mower. If the seat isn't right, you're not gonna be happy using this machine. So make sure you either negotiate the price down so you could buy a used seat from a dealer or even a brand new seat, or maybe they have a different seat they could throw on. For instance, this mower behind me on my right is a Toro. The seat was bad on it. We threw an old used Gravely seat on there. The seat isn't a matching seat. It's a little bit of a Frankenstein now, but at least it's a comfortable seat and whoever's driving this mower is gonna stay dry and enjoy riding it a lot longer. So we're done with the basic look around. We're gonna dive more in depth to all the mechanical pieces of this machine. At this point is when we're gonna crank up the unit and actually go run it for some time. We want the unit to get hot. We want the hydraulics to get hot. We want the engine to get hot. I want every part of this machine to get tested. So you need to test the machine for at least 10 minutes. So if you're typing, you're talking to this guy before you get there, ask him if there's some grass you can mow on property, 
and if you're allowed to mow it for at least 10 minutes. If they refuse that or say no, that's not an option, that's a huge red flag. But if they're okay with you doing that, that's what you need to do. You need to crank it up, listen how it starts, make sure the starter's working on the first turn, listen to the battery if it has power. Little things like that as you crank it up, but then go run it for 10 minutes. So after you're done mowing with the machine, we get to our second thing you're gonna check. We're gonna check the engine. The engine check consists of a few things. We want to check the oil color. What is the ideal color when you're looking at a used mower to buy? I'm always very suspicious if I see brand new oil in a used mower. You changed it right before you sold it, and maybe, but more than likely, it was disgustingly black and you were nervous I would see that, and so you changed it retroactively rather than proactively. So I like to see brown oil. Even black oil is okay with me, as long as the level's okay. Ideal oil color, if I could pick one, if I was able to pick a used color oil when buying a used mower, would be about the color of a brown bag. Once you go brown, the other colors let you down. <laughs> so ideally you want your oil used, but not too used. I know that's a little picky, so I'm not saying it has to be that way. It, if it's black, I'm okay with that, as long as it's the right level. When it's super black and low on level and thick and doesn't want to come off my fingers, or I can't smear it enough to make it seem clear, that's what makes me nervous. That means they've neglected the machine, haven't changed the, hour, the oil for at least 150 hours, and maybe they've been topping it off for a long period of time rather than changing it all out at once. That could cause a lot of engine problems. It's not gonna be good for whoever buys it for me. It's not gonna be good for me. And it might not be good for you. So if you're checking your oil on your Facebook run, trying to buy your new mower, check the oil's coloring. And then ask some questions, probe a little bit. This is an interesting point in the examination of buying anything used, is seeing if the seller is going to lie to me. If I ask him, how many oil changes have you done on this? He might have an answer off the top of his head. Maybe it's gonna be really rehearsed, or maybe it's gonna be- Something I do not think I have done in, well, ever. But pay attention to what he says next. There's gonna be a lot of ways it can go. Ideally, he did a break in oil change at 10 hours and has done an oil change every 50 to 100 hours since. I recommend always doing the filter with the oil. The manual is gonna suggest you do the oil at 10 hours and then every 100 hours, and you could do the filter every other but every other filter changes might work in certain ports, parts of the country, but definitely not recommended for severe conditions like the South or specifically Florida. He might rattle off the exact definition on the manual and that seems a little concerning to me. Or he might say, I remember doing a break in and I've done it every couple months since then. You know, that might bring me some comfort as long as that oil was that paper brown color. It's important to mesh those two questions together. Let me look at your oil and how often do you change it? And then just pay attention because if you can't trust what he's saying about the oil, I doubt he's gonna tell you the truth about many other things with the machine. The other couple things you wanna do when you're checking out your engine is check the actual dipstick. These dipsticks are made out of nylon 90. It's a type of material that is made basically a plastic, it's a nylon, that actually is made to change color if the engine gets overheated. If the engine gets around 350 degrees, or the tip of the stick will be in the oil and it will begin to kind of turn brown, almost like a burnt stick, you know? If you pull that dipstick out and the end of it's really, really brown and it has low oil, you know you really have a recipe. But it is possible that this machine is pouring oil and there's not enough oil to touch the stick to even get the stick hot. And so it's not a foolproof plan if you have oil leaks. Basically the way these sticks work is that they go down and they're actually submerged under oil during operation. And if that oil gets really hot, the tip of the oil will get brown. But if your oil level's too low, the tip isn't touching the oil and the tip will stay nice. Or somebody can always replace the dipstick. So check the yellow top of the dipstick, see if it looks brand new or not. If it looks like it's properly faded with the rest of the engine, then you can know maybe it's original. You could even ask them, hey, did you ever change the dipstick? And they might tell you the truth. Oh yeah, I had to change it one time, I broke it or whatever. Or the tip melted off because I ran it so low on oil, it overheated and started to melt it like crazy. More than likely, they won't tell you that. So the last thing you wanna check when you're looking at your engine is for oil leaks. The way you notice an oil leak is dirt clinging to your engine. It's not typical that you'll see slippery oil and shiny, glimmery stuff all over your engine, but your engine might be coated with dirt. Basically, oil, when it gets hot and starts to slowly escape from the pan gasket or bottom seal or top seal, it becomes so thin and it coats the entire outside of this engine, or at least around the area that it's leaking from. And then dirt and dust cling to that oil, just like glitter at a kid's birthday party. Let's just say the customer washed it before you got there and you can't see any dirt on the engine. That's why you're gonna run it for those 10 minutes to allow any of those seals to leak and for dirt and dust to cling back to it. That will give you a chance to see it give you more visual because shiny metal and very, very thin oil sometimes can be hard to see, but dirt on oil is pretty easy to see. So that's something you do want to use as a kind of an indicator if I have an oil leak. 
Now an oil leak can be a serious issue. It can mean it's overheated. It can mean it's ran low on oil. It can mean a lot of things. But if they continue to top it off with oil and never let it get super low, it's not something that's necessarily catastrophic for the life of the machine. It is something that can be repaired. It's just something that you should know about before you get into it so that you don't run it out of oil or that you can negotiate the price to, to compensate for that you know, problem with the engine. So let's just say you notice this is an oil leak, you point it out to the owner and say, hey, I would want to get that fixed before I use it commercially. A typical oil leak problem usually costs around $600. It's around $60 parts and five hours labor, six hours labor. So in that six to $700 range, you can get an engine resealed as long as it's new enough and the bolts aren't all frozen. If it's an older machine, say an older Kohler and it has an oil leak, it has 3,500 hours on it, those steel bolts and that aluminum head are guaranteed to get stuck and you're gonna break some off and that's gonna increase that bill. And you might want them to take off $1,000 to $1,200 because you might have to get a new head in the process of resealing it. It's just something to keep in mind when you are pricing out and shopping for a used mower is if you see an oil leak, you should definitely lower the cost a little bit or lower the, what you're willing to pay a little bit. It is something you can fix yourself if you're pretty handy and you have you know, a couple extra days to spare. It's not something I personally would try to do because it's a pretty serious repair. The next thing we check, the third thing, is the hydraulics. The hydraulics are the second most expensive part on this unit, and there's two of them. It's almost like you have two engines down there. If any of them feel at all funny in testing, it's probably a good idea to walk away from the unit. The hydraulics should feel really smooth. They should feel consistent. They should feel buttery and powerful on slopes. They shouldn't feel chattery, bumpy. They shouldn't feel weak or have any kind of dead spot in them. If it does have a tracking issue, let's say you're driving forward and it's slowly drifting to the left, that's okay. Generally, it's adjustable as long as when you go backwards, it is more powerful on the left-hand side. You know, it's a give and take relationship. If I want the left side to go faster, I can make the left side faster with adjusting it, but it's gonna make my left side slower in reverse. Does that make sense? The sound should be a consistent whining hum, almost the sound of a whale calling to its pod. But it shouldn't sound like Chewbacca riding a whale in a dangerous fight through space, right? It should sound like a But it shouldn't sound But you can hear all kinds of and it will start going crazy on you. You don't want that, right? You want to be smooth. You want to hear a consistent whining or calling, mm, but nothing, nothing crazy. And it shouldn't be any louder than your engine. Your engine should be the loudest thing when you're operating it. Another important reason we get the unit hot in the beginning is that cold hydraulics perform really well. You know, a lot of times, even if it has a hydraulic issue, even a serious hydraulic issue, for the first five minutes, you can drive it. You can drive it in and out of the building. You can drive it out of a shed. You can pull it up onto a trailer. But if you run it for 10 minutes, that oil gets hot, things start to act up. So it's important that you run these machines before you buy them to make sure that that hydraulic is not gonna be a problem. Hydraulic fluid is one of the hardest things to tell by eye if it's bad. So this is gonna be something you're gonna to have to really listen to the person you're buying it from to see if they're lying to you. So the ideal servicing on a hydraulic should have been around 75 to 100 hours for break-in and every 400 to 500 hours after that point for hydraulic fluid changes, and that's fluid and filters. And so if you ask them, hey, how often have you done the hydro change? Have you ever done a break-in oil change, hydro change? Listen to their answer. If they're lying to you, they might say something like, oh yeah, I do it every time I do my oil. I, I never had to do it. I've never had an issue with this hydraulic system. But both of those are red flags. Nobody's changing it every 100 hours or 50 hours, or they're changing their engine oil every 500 hours, which is also bad, because hydro fluid is expensive. A hydro service on one of these things is gonna run you a couple hundred bucks. And so it's important to actually know when the last one was. Maybe you don't have to get one right away, but I would like to see that on paper and ask for a receipt before I trust it. Hydraulics are expensive, and you wanna make sure they're in good operating order before you commit to buying a used machine. The fourth thing we check is the deck. When you are mowing with the machine, I want you to be listening and paying attention to what kind of noises is coming from your feet area, right, your deck. Underneath your feet, where your deck is, really your blades are attached to spindles, and then your belt is routed through pulleys. So your spindles have bearings in them, and those bearings can go bad. And when they're going bad, blades will kind of wobble, they might squeal. <laughs> I'm the gift that keeps on giving, baby. It's something that's pretty expensive. Normally to replace bearings in each spindle, you're gonna spend around 150 bucks 
per spindle. That adds up. So if you take the belt off and check all of your spindles, you can grab the blade with the mower off, of course, and wiggle it side to side. If there's any kind of play, that means it needs new bearings. Or if it doesn't spin smoothly, that means it needs new bearings. And it's something to pay attention to. Dull blades, you're gonna get dull blades on a used mower. That's no big deal. You're gonna have to end up buying those. It's gonna cost you around $60. You wanna check your idler pulleys. Route it on your deck, I'll point them out to you. You're gonna wanna spin them and wiggle them side to side and see how they feel. They shouldn't be grindy, they shouldn't be growly, they shouldn't have a lot of side to side play. A little bit of play is okay and a sixteenth of an inch is okay. But if it's a quarter inch or more, no good that's gonna to need to be replaced. It's not a terribly expensive, but it's more ammo for your negotiating, right? Can you can consider those a $75 off per idler pulley, right? Doesn't mean the deck's total, doesn't mean walk away. It's actually gonna be in your benefit to go ahead and replace those if they're bad, but maybe you can get that money taken off so that you can replace them on his dime rather than yours. The other thing you wanna check is deck belts. I know it might not seem like a big deal. Deck belts used to be pretty cheap, but nowadays a good big size deck belt like that is $150, $175. And so if it has cracks in it or dry rotting, you might wanna to try to consider that in your negotiating price. There's also a hydro or hydro belt underneath and both your idler arms. So there's a hydro idler arm. You wanna make sure that thing moves. You can grab it and kind of put some tension on it see if it wiggles, and your deck idler arm. It has a bushing on a pivot. You wanna make sure that bushing is freed up and make sure it's working. Can you buy it without checking those things? Of course, it just might cost you a little out of pocket a few weeks down the road if there's a lot of play. Guys, your deck is the whole reason for the mower, right? You buy a mower, you buy hydraulics, you buy an engine, you buy a seat, you have a frame, all so that you can hang a deck on it and cut grass with it. This is a cutting grass machine, so we wanna make sure it's capable of cutting grass before we buy it, right? That's why we wanna test it. That's why we want to mow with it. We want to make sure that clutch turns on and off and it's not growling or squealing. The fifth and final thing are the hours. And when I say hours, I mean hours and age. They kind of correspond, but kind of not. I want you to check the hour meter. There's a very easy metric for hour meters to kind of understand what it correlates to a car. Let's just say, for example, the mower you're looking at has 2,000 hours on it. That might not sound like a ton to you. Doing some basic math, it's the equivalent of around 200,000 miles on a vehicle. So if you are comfortable buying a work truck with 200,000 miles on it, then you could probably be comfortable buying a mower with 200,000 miles on it. It's gonna come with similar issues that that car with 200,000 miles is gonna come with it, right? That's a lot of hours on your engine and on your hydraulics and on your deck and all these things. So just keep that in mind when the price. If it's 50% of a new one, that might be higher than you wanna spend. If you can get it down to below 50% of a new one, then maybe we're in the realm there, but they've used up more than half of its life and definitely the better half of its life. So I, ideally you'd wanna be in that one third of new price if it's around that 200,000 mark or lower if you can find one. A 200,000 mile car is not totaled, it still has a lot of life in it. And if you're in a position where you can't afford a new one, it's not a bad place to start. Three mowers behind me all have less than 200,000 miles on them, or I should say 2,000 hours. This one here, I think has around 14 or 17. This one has 12, and this one only has 350. But there's a big difference between the three machines behind me. One of these machines is almost 20 years old, and age definitely matters when it comes to lawnmowers. These aren't like vintage cars where the rarer the better, or the older the fancier. No, this is like something you gotta use all the time. It's like something you're gonna rely on, like a parachute. You don't want a vintage parachute, you want a good working parachute. parachute! This is something you're gonna be relying your mortgage on, paying your employees on, your truck payments on, your kids going to school on, and I want it to crank every day and go make money, right? Getting older is a bad idea. I really don't recommend buying used mowers older than 10 years. This machine behind me is a 2007. 2013 is be as old as a mower as I would be comfortable buying to use commercially. I might be willing to buy an older machine if I'm gonna use it for my house because I'm not relying on it for my business and I can wait on parts. But most manufacturers stop manufacturing parts for models that are older than 10 years old. For a unit like this, has something go wrong and my local dealership doesn't have it, I'm gonna wait longer than if I have a newer unit that was only made a few years ago. So that's something to really consider. If you're looking to buy a vintage mower to use commercially, I highly don't recommend it. Keep it younger than 10 years. Keep it under 2,000 hours. If it's over either of those, use it to your advantage in negotiating. Guys, these are my five helpful tips for buying a used mower. I hope this video was helpful for you. I hope you can pick out and find a great used mower to uh, add to your fleet or to start out with. Just make sure you're smart when you do it. Find a machine that it looks good. Make sure the engine has good oil in it, has the right level in it. Make sure the hydraulics feel, feel right. 
Make sure the deck is quiet and mows well, and make sure the hours are low or it's not older than 10 years. Those are my five top tips for buying a good used mower. Thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, turn that bell on, subscribe, and please check out some other helpful videos. I appreciate you guys. Seriously, have a good day. Thank you.